Danke, Danje. Hello, I'm going to Whitehorse all alone. Wow, almost on a budget with no film crew, no makeup or friends except for the one we made. Just us experiencing the magical Northern Lights, checking out many of its famous landmarks, conquering the wind and snow on the snowmobile, on the traditional dog sled, and in the car all the way to Kwani National Park to check out its breathtaking sceneries. As well, trying our luck with ice fishing and getting a ski lesson one on one. Not to mention visiting many of its amazing museums to learn about Yukon's history. We'll be honoring the indigenous people of this land, its courageous past, and its magnificent culture and traditions, as well warming up in a natural hot spring and getting rescued by the Mounties, and ending the journey on a high note for some spectacular views, all done safely, inexpensively, and easily. Anything we can do, you can do. DIY Destinations Whitehorse and Kwani National Park, and you are invited. We are so fortunate to live in a small world with so many cultures, so much beauty, and so much diversity. The world waits for no one, and it's up to each of us to discover its magnificent destinations. I want to make travel accessible to all of us by showing how it can be done safely and inexpensively. Located at the historic mile 918 on the Alaska Highway and occupy the traditional land of the Kualandong First Nation, meaning running water through canyons, and both shore of the Yukon River. Formerly called the Canyon City, its rapid near the Miles Canyon is supposed to resemble a mean of a charging white horse. Today, it's a vibrant city of 32,000 representing 80% of the entire population of Yukon Territory and the heart of its economy, arts, culture, and tourism. That's why we are here, to discover this part of our home country, to experience this incredible land, to learn about its proud history, to listen to the story from our First Nations, to face our past challenges, to take part and celebrate our futures together, to enjoy the best what this land has to offer. Most importantly, experiencing the warm hospitality of its resilient people. Welcome to the Yukon! Yeah! White Horse is accessible by car from Alaska Highway 1 and Highway 2, as well by ferry, but it's too complicated. The easiest and the most inexpensive way to get here is by flying. It's completely free. If you are a bird, since my co-hosts are a human, <laughs> we needed a boarding pass. Sarah took advantage of the Air North Connector Fair. It's available between Whitehorse and the cities in British Columbia and Alberta. The onboard snacks, meals, and two check luggage are all included, all for $99 as our filming of this episode. What an amazing deal. And I think she looks pretty happy. Chocolate chip cookies and uh, have a great day today. I'm making friends with all my seatmates. My journey began on one of Air Canada's daily flights from Vancouver and taking about two and a half hours. Along the way, be sure to enjoy some of those spectacular views. I can see we're getting closer and closer to the ground. It looks cold. So make sure you bring something really warm to come to Yukon. Or else you might be in trouble for real. That's the sound of the air bridge coming towards uh, the aircraft. That being said, let's get out of here. Well, actually, you know, let them get out of here first. Ladies and gentlemen, we have just landed in White Forest and our adventure has just begun. First of all, I just got off the plane and I can feel the breeze. It is 
really, really cold. So make sure you bring extremely, extremely triple layer winter jacket, something super warm, or else you are in trouble for real. Yes, I did repeat my advice on bringing warm clothing. While I was praying for Air Canada not to lose our luggage, the amazing staff at the Air North was waiting to welcome us to make sure Sarah and I got fed. Their infant meals are so famous, they are sold in the supermarkets across Whitehorse. Hopefully these delicious meals will wake us up. After all, <laughs> we were so exhausted that we didn't even realize the camera's off. Okay, familiar face right here, right? So once again, now this time I will gonna walk, we are gonna welcome you to Whitehorse. Holy smoke, yeah. I haven't operated a camera for so long. For better or for worse, Oh. I'm here again. Yep. Uh, we're gonna tour White Horse and bring you the best it has to offer. Oh yes. And let's hope we get some more dramas on camera, <laughs> right? Oh, I'm sure we will. All right. Downtown Whitehorse is less than 5 kilometers away. If you don't have any luggage, it's only a 45 minutes walking exercise. There's a frequent public bus that runs hourly and takes uh, about 15 minutes. Exact cash fare, please. For those of you who didn't bring any bling bling in Canadian dollars, there is a bank machine inside the airport terminal. Please, do not ever accept fixed exchange rates. <laughs> Just go with the flow. However, if you are a crazy rich Asian, Y'all walk on to experience the world's most expensive airport taxi. The ride only takes about 10 minutes, but it will set you back uh, more than $25. No kidding. However, we got lucky. Instead of giving us directions to the bus stop, a ride was offered to us by these amazing locals. Welcome to the Yukon, and you'll see much more than this too. We so, trust you. The people here are friendly. They're Open door policy, you'll be welcome. Air Listen North? to her. Look at Air North with their cheesecake. Oh my goodness. You have lots of stuff. They're amazing. Checking into our hotel here in Yukon. It's our home base, so we're going to be staying here every night and doing day trips, etc. Oh man, so here we go. This is our room. No, we are not sleeping together. It's very sad. Today's Valentine's Day. Our second Valentine's together. Last one we were in India. And what did we get? We got a liver, like a heart shaped liver or something like that. Yes, after settling down in our sponsored hotel, Destination Family Hotel, there is very little time except for a brief rest. Not enough time for love making. After all, the typical Northern Lights tour begins at 10 30 pm. So let's get going. No time to waste. So we're, we've just been walking down the Alaska Highway um, and are just crossing Main Street here in Whitehorse. We're heading to meet our group for our Northern Light tour tonight. So we've just arrived to our cabin and um, everybody's coming in and we're gonna have a little um, what to do during the viewing of the Aurora Lights, I suppose, and then we're all gonna head out and get some great shots, I hope. Now this is a typical Aurora tour where a tour company will pick you up at your hotel or meet you at a designated point and bring you about 25 minutes away from the city light. The price range between $100 to $200 and most of them will have a cabin like this and a campfire with free snacks and drinks and most of them will even provide you marshmallows for you to make your own s'mores now i do have to mention that this tour we are on are partially sponsored by northern tales the northern light are beautiful dancing wave of light that have captivated people for millennia the Cree First Nation believed that Aurora was part of life's circle and was the spirit of the dead who remained in the sky but apart from their loved ones. These light were spirit of the departed friends and relatives trying to communicate with those they had left behind on earth. The First Nation tribe in Yukon also believe these light are spirits from people who have passed on in a bad way or in a hard way. Therefore, their spirits get lonely. 
so they could come down and take you if you look at them or you draw attention. Although these are legends, this spectacular light show is indeed a violent event. The energized particle from the sun's solar wind slam into Earth's upper atmosphere at a speed up to 72 million kilometers per hour, resulting in emitting light of various colors and complexity. Hence, our planet's magnetic field protects us from the onslaught. Now, let me spill some beans here. Seeing the Northern Light is a matter of luck. The chance are pretty good between November to March on most nights. You also need to be super lucky on a super clear night to see something like this with your naked eyes. Now, I'm going to brag <laughs> that I did capture these footages by myself. But with a long exposure on a tripod with a very fast lens on a mirrorless camera. For those of you who use a smartphone, <laughs> they got you covered. So, if you didn't travel with a tripod, don't worry. They have them for uh, guests to use, which is awesome. Most tour operators like the Northern Tales has knowledgeable staff that can help you adjust the camera setting for that perfect shot. However, many also offer to take photos for you on their professional mirrorless cameras and send it to you at no cost. I think Sarah's having too much fun on these photos. Most tours ends at 2.30 a.m. and definitely it's time to head back to get some sleep. We got early morning tomorrow. The one thing I really love about the hotel we are staying is the breakfast. Uh, there is staff from over dozens of countries, so there is no set breakfast, but every morning the front desk will give you a call and ask you what you want to eat, and they will just make it for you. So today, uh, I do miss omelets, and guess what they made for me today? Come on, we got to check this out. I think this will fill up for the rest of our day. Once again, my accommodation sponsor is Destination Family Hotel. They are located right at the heart of downtown and offer both rooms and full suites at an amazing price. There's even an in-house laundry mat and minutes walk to the three supermarkets. But my favorite is their amazing breakfast. Uh, let's say more of that for another morning. As you can see, I'm getting the first dose of Yukon's morning winter weather here in Whitehorse. And trust me, to conquer this kind of weather, you definitely need to bring um, snow jackets, snow pants, uh, boots, and so Our on. Our sponsor is the Base Outdoor Rentals. Yes, I'm reading it. Just to make sure I'm correct. And uh, for giving us all the gears to conquer and survive in this weather thanks guys now the second advice I'm going to give you is if you are going somewhere further away like visiting a national park make sure you do that first uh, because if the winter does not cooperate or anything like that you can always do activities within the city there's enough stuff to do uh, however if you leave until the last days or last couple days and the winter weather does not permit you to drive safely you might miss out the opportunity. So remember, safety comes first. With that being said, I wish you a safe drive, just like we are going to be doing safe driving ourselves. With that being said, I'm going in to get my rental card. Another rule you must follow, leave early and start driving back before the sunset to be safe. Even worse, if you get yourself into trouble, most likely there ain't any chicks. I mean, uh, cellular receptions for you to call and ask for help, or hospital in the middle of nowhere. With that being said, drive safely. As you can see, the winter driving here in Yukon is a bit unforgiving. That's why, number one, you have to be confident and you have to drive smart. And safe means go slow. Once again, like, there's no point going somewhere, getting injured, and ruin your holiday. Better be slow, be late, and be back safe. That way, you can enjoy not just this trip, many, many trips to come. 
after watching my travel show, DIY Destinations. Did I mention to ask you to make sure to enjoy the spectacular scenery along the way? It's free, at least during the hour and a half long drive. If you need to relieve yourself, <laughs> there's a couple of these places along the way. Free as well, uh, part of the package. Uh, another uniquely to Yukon is a crack windshield are found on almost every vehicle. Uh, they don't use road salt here, rather actual stone that actually caused a chip to the glass. So no, no need to panic. With that being said, welcome to Heinz Junction within the Kwani National Park. Ladies and gentlemen, can you hear that? That is the only thing that is welcoming us right now at this cultural center and the Heinz Visitor Information Center. We made a very time consuming and expensive, after our gas aren't cheap here, mistake by driving an hour and a half to Heinz Junction. I fall victim to Google Maps hour and guess what happened? This is closed seasonally. So please guys, ask around before you make the costly mistake we did. Forget everything Charles just said. We actually ran into a staff member and they've invited us into the center with VIP access. Daku means our house in Southern Tushomi, an endangered language spoken by the people of Champagne and Ajax First Nation who first occupied this land for over 2,000 years. It's also one of the first four First Nations to sign the Land Claim Agreement in 1992, and today it has its own First Nation governments with the main administration located in Heinz Junction. In the center, the, one of the major attractions is this map right here, which covers the territory of the Champagne and Ajax First Nation. The cultural center celebrates and showcases the people, language, culture, and tradition of Champagne and Ajax First Nation. It regularly hosts exhibitions of precious and rare traditional artifacts and artworks. They also offer campfire talks, songs, and dance classes, and other cultural events. On the permanent exhibit are the information showcasing the history, traditions, and language of this First Nation, as well as the milestone in achieving the right to the self-governance. The best way to support the cultural center is to give a generous donation or to shop. I got a feeling Sarah is pretty talented in doing just that, and she will be asking me for my credit card shortly. Yes, that's exactly what happened. Awesome. Your visit to the Daku Cultural Center is not complete until you've had the opportunity to walk around the gift shop. There is lots of handmade, beautiful items, one-of-a-kind items, things that you can purchase and help support the local people. For instance, this handmade mukluk. Along the way to one of the main attractions in the Kwani National Park, the Kathleen Lake, be sure to check out some of the lookout points. This plaque talks about how Kluwani is one of four parks in the region that is protected by UNESCO. Um, it sits here at one of the viewpoints for Kathleen Lake. Take a look. The Kwani National Park and Reserve was established in 1972 and covered the area of 22,000 square kilometers while pending the land claim of the First Nations. Once the agreement was reached with the Champagne and Ajax First Nation, the eastern portion of the reserve became a national park in 1993 covering 5,900 square kilometers, administered by the Parks Canada, while the larger western section remains a reserve, awaiting the final land claims with the Kwani First Nation.
The main entrance is located 25 kilometers south of Heinz Junction. As mentioned, it does get dark early during winter. But if you come during the summer, you are in luck since there's 18 hours of daylight and all facilities are open, including Parks Canada campsite, picnic ground, a beach, a boat launch, canoeing, and two trails. First being the Coconut Trail, a half kilometer wheelchair accessible boardwalk, and a five kilometer challenging King's Throne Trail, ascend to the Alpine Kirk. The native name Mata Aman translates into something frozen inside the lake. While it is unclear how the name Kathleen was given to this lake, according to the Daku Cultural Center, it was the name given to a Scottish girl left behind by William Hume after he immigrated to Canada without his parents at age of 16. Eventually, he joined the paramilitary Northwestern Mounted Police stationed at Delton Trail. Historically, the Kathleen Lake frees up between mid to late December until late May or early June. Due to the climate change, the pier for the ice cover surface are now becoming increasingly shorter in recent years. In the summer, you'll find the lake to be filled with exceptionally clear waters in the presence of landlocked, non-migratory population of sockeye salmon that solely lives in the fresh waters, along with the rainbow trout, burbot, whitefish, and many other fish species. It is really getting dark. Even though we won't stay for too much longer, we won't leave without some spectacular footage of ourselves to show off on our social media. Remember what I said about leaving early and driving back before sunset? <laughs> the rental car provides you one of these guys because man, this is a, such a lifesaver. Especially, this is a rear view camera. Just make sure that is not blocked. With that being said, it's time to head back. First, make sure your tank is half full at least because, you know, in case of like emergency or anything like that, your next 100 kilometers will be very painful if you run out of gas. And number two is always make sure uh, you take a rest if necessary, drink some coffee to stay awake, and as well, make sure. I drive at night with my glasses, you don't want to take that risk. And please, most importantly, go slow. Once again, it's better to be late than never. So, have a safe drive. Oh, sorry. Sarah and I need to go and grab a couple Joe. We have to lead by example, right? Perfect. A nice large cup of coffee to keep us awake on the long drive back to Whitehorse. And here's a little secret. If you come to a top spot gas station here in Heinz Junction at end of the night, guess what? All the hot food are 30% off. Because I guess I'm special, right? Bro? Yeah. Now, I believe in supporting the local economy wherever we go. Here's the problem. The people are just so nice and they won't even accept our money for both the coffee and the hot food. I think it's because I'm the cutest Asian in all of Yukon. So I decided to do a promo on the spot for this little gas station. I also did it at no cost. And don't tell me that is not called fair trade. With that being said, let's drive. And remember to drive safely. The ride took approximately two hours, slightly longer since we drove slower given the low visibility and heavy snowfall. Our next problem, we are freaking hungry. Absolutely no energy to grab takeout. But thank goodness, I got the number for the United Nations World Food Program for some hunger relief. I believe they drop off hot pizzas from the chopper to hungry people. Okay, never mind. Uh, Air North gave us some food to survive on. First on the menu, Indian curry with rice and their famous cheesecake. Oh my goodness, thank you so much. 
She's the best, fella. She is the best. Look what she cooked for us every morning. Mm -hmm. And another fresh start here at Star. We got another early morning. Not surprisingly, our delicious breakfast is waiting for us at the dining room by the amazing staff at the Destination Family Hotel. Mmm. And also, oh my god, I think I can. This is my breakfast, lunch, and dinner. <laughs> oh, wow. No time to waste. After fueling up, we needed to hit the road again for our next adventure with a hero. No, no, a shiro of mine. Everyone, please say hi to Marcel. I am the owner of Alayuk Adventure and I started uh, this company 15 years ago. Uh, we organize dog sledding too because I have sled dogs and uh, I like to share my passion. But the Yukon for me is the be best place on earth because um, the winter are long, so it's good for us. My dogs are Alaskan Husky and they come from uh, long distance racing kennel. I keep all my dogs until the end of their life. Wow, that's I so don't nice. like to sell or dogs. It's why I'm still working and maybe <laughs> I will be still working until 80 or so. <laughs> Three, two, one, go! From Whitehorse Yukon Territory, Canada, that is Marcel Persina. And I did arrive at Marcel has raised sled dogs since 1988. Along with her pack of sled dogs, Marcel has completed in the two biggest thousand mile races, the Yukon Quest in 2012 and the Adidarod in 2014, as well as 2015. We have arrived again, Alayuk Adventures. Yeah, that'd be great. Oh, so all these are retired? Yes, except the cat. <laughs> <laughs> the cat's not retired. The, the, race, the Yukon Quest, the Adita Hood, and uh, a lot of... Uh, wow. Lead dog. Two. Yeah, oh, the lead dog as well. Yeah. You should come prepared, but if not, they also have snow pants to keep you warm. So, right there. Um, I think I'm almost there. How are you? Oh, you look so excited. We urge you to do your due diligence, making sure you go with a reputable operator, one that loves, understands, and cares for their pack. Someone like Marcel and her team of operators here at Alayuk Adventures. Get it? Alaska, Yukon, Alayuk. As Marcel is committed to her pack, she does not adopt them out after retirement. Therefore, she only keeps as many dogs as she can care for until their last days here on Earth. Now that we are bundled up, it's finally time to meet our new best friends. <laughs> I made a new friend. New friend it is. These dogs are so cute. I think I need to get my own now, right? Are you coming home with me? I think it might be the camera. Hello. I think he's my <laughs> my new friend and co-worker. Hello. What's your name? Hobbit. Thanks for coming with me today. Ooh. Uh, I think I'm in love. Sled driver. She's so famous. That's a famous champion right there. Yeah. Excited? I'm super excited. I love dog sledding. And um, being driven means you get to just sit back and relax. I love the sunlight. 
Alleyuk Adventures is always fully booked due to the fact that Marcel and her team choose to keep the operation a small family business rather than to expand to meet the demand. Therefore, we advise you book early if you want to experience this majestic adventure with the legend that is Marcel and her pack of 45 Alaskan Huskies. So that's our driver in the back working hard, directing the dogs, and uh, she loves these dogs. We've been doing it for like, say, 35 years. That's how I experience. And here's a downhill. Dogs are considered to be man's best friend, perhaps better recognized as human's best friend. And I, for one, often prefer the company of a dog to another human. As far as archaeologists can tell, dog sledding was invented by the native and Inuit people in the northern parts of modern Canada, before rapidly spreading throughout the continent and beyond. Current archaeological evidence shows that this mode of transportation has been dated to around 1000 AD. So that's our driver right up there. He's amazing and uh, he knows and really good friends all the dogs. You need to have amazing working relationship colleagues here, you know, to put this all together. <laughs> Three months of experience is enough to know all the dogs. Three months, that's what you said. History shows us that the First Nations organized the dogs as pack animals for transporting supplies in moving camps. Initially, dogs carried small packs of supplies on their backs, though it was discovered that they could drastically increase the load the dogs transported if they pulled it. Therefore, on the Great Plains, the dogs pulled travois, and in the northern forests, toboggans and sleds were used. Horses gradually replaced dogs for transport as they became more available on the northern plains in the 18th century. Another fun fact about these dogs is um, the average working uh, age, actually, uh, of the dogs you see hung out in our pack is uh, eight years old. Um, however, the oldest is actually uh, in the house, it's actually 16. So we got all generation member of the society in dogs here represented. Dog sled operators offer both half day as well as full day tours. And most also offer you the option to try your hand at driving the sled if you're feeling adventurous. So you are always welcome to chill in the sled, giving you the opportunity to take the perfect shots to update all your socials. That's fun. <laughs> This is the home base and we are, as you can see, we are coming in. Beautiful. My goodness, it's so sad. Marcel is a published author and offers her books in both English and French. She will even personalize and autograph a copy just for you. Actually, uh, there you go. Problem? Thanks for calling. 
after such an intensive experience, we definitely need to chill somewhere. Uh, the catch, it requires us to hike 6 hours to get there. Uh, actually, let's just drive, it's only 25 minutes by car. And no, there is no public transportation at the moment. Although there's occasional private shuttle, it's a little pricey. I know, I know, it's a total bitch getting there, but it's well worth it. After all, you get to experience something naturally hot in the land of ice and snow. Okay, we finally are here. We definitely need uh, to. We need to relax oh, our muscles. Yes, yeah. So we're gonna jump into the onsen pools here. Charles is about to get naked. Let's go inside. I, I just want to warn you. Uh, I don't have a six pack. I do have a one pack. I'm very well rounded. So don't laugh, or else I'm coming after you on Facebook. <laughs> that shows you how old I am. Let's get going. Okay. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Eclipse Norway Hot Spring. Before you dive in, let me give you a brief introduction. Although this facility is nearly open in 2022 after three years of very expensive renovation from the former Tahini Hot Spring, but their history dates back to 1902 when the two original owners William Allen Piquet and A.R. Gordon applied to the government to lease the land and eventually successfully able to purchase the land for the rock bottom price of $2 per acre and constructed the Tahini Hot Spring named after the Tahini River. The bathhouse was put up on sale in a court dispute in 1947, and the ownership was transferred to a Canadian miner Carl Springer. The ownership exchange had numerous times until 2014 when it was taken over by the current owner. So it's time for us to get changed, step one that is. So you, need, you need to shower before you put on your bathing suit so you keep the hot springs nice and clean. I totally agree. All right, see you in the other side. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna get undressed as well. Am I excited? I am so done. Let's head to the spa. Just keep in mind, this is a mobile phone free facility. We have to respect the, uh, uh, the privacy of the other guests. But if you really need that photo for Instagram, the staff here would be happy to take your photo as long as nobody else is in the shot and then they'll email it to you. Okay, this shows all of the minerals at the hot spring and the best thing is is that the sulfate is actually a solid rather than a gas so it doesn't smell like rotten eggs here. Once again, just a warning, I don't have a six pack, I only have a one pack. But once again, I'm a very wild grounded man. But well, that being said, oh my god, oh my god, oh my god. Oh my goodness. Oh my goodness. Oh my goodness. Oh my goodness. No, oh. oh my goodness, <laughs> this is spectacular. The main and the largest pool is named Eclipse Pool. The designs are heavily drawn by the Japanese influence, including incorporating the elements of natural beauty of the landscape along with rock line pool and the sound of cascading waterfall. If you want to just like sit down and you know get your feet wet, or Sarah's a really important time. She's going to the deeper end, to the dark zone, right? Eh. This is the best seat in the house. The hot water comes from here, so if you like it hot, find this spot. And I cannot resist showing off my Olympic swim skills. Oh. Sorry guys, not deep enough for me to show off. The second pool is named the Onsen Pool, the smallest. The water is mainly fed by the Cascade Waterfall and provides a stone bench for seating. I will let you know our little secret plans they got. In the in the future, the plan here is after 11 o'clock, um, they can rent these out privately so you can see the Northern Star right in the hot spring and how nice that will be. Oh my god, this is a life. I'm not leaving anytime soon, so don't wait for me guys.
The last pool that's open during the winter is the Aurora Pool. This is the most accessible pool among the four, offering contour benches with land bar. In the spring, summer, and fall, it also offers outdoor showers, cold plunges, fireball seating area, just to name few. So, for those of you who like to have a hot pool with a view, this is it. This is actually Sarah's favorite. And it's also the hottest, right? It's also my favorite as well because I think I'm hot. Hey, I'm just a cute guy. There is a hidden pool. It consists of cold water and used between the hot pools. As a result, it is closed in the winter. With that being said, here is a little advice for those of you who want to join us. You can take your time and enjoy, right? I mean, yes. you've been here a long time. If you don't want to line up or be on a wait list, book online. That's and you'll save money. Five so. bucks. As you can see, these actually are Himalayan salt and it's heated and you can actually smell it. Uh, but you know what? What I think I really need right now is ooh, this right here. Oh yeah. It's just so unfair that women often tell me I am as dry as a rock. Now, I'd like to take this opportunity to complain that Sarah likes to get wet and steamy a little too much. Most likely, this is where you can find her. There are two steam rooms here at Eclipse. One, no scent. But this one, this one's my favorite. It smells like eucalyptus. We finally ended our visit to this lovely hot spring by getting stoned. Without any legal or illegal substance, that is. Make sure you hydrate. You are going to be sweating a lot. There is complimentary water. So today there is cucumber lemon mint as well as orange lemon. I'm going to try the cucumber. For those of you who want to take a shower, think before you act. So when you are done, it is recommended that you don't take a shower, but leave the, all the mineral on, because if you wash it off, that mineral all goes away. So with that being said, I'm going to take their advice and leave mine on. Hopefully, I will be 10 years younger, and maybe 20, if not, maybe like at least 20 minutes younger. Before leaving, don't forget to fill up at their in-house Hot Rock Cafe. They offer locally made fresh sandwiches, pastries, sushi rolls, and more, as well as a variety of tasty hot and cold drinks, including beers from Yukon Breweries. But let's not drink and drive. We need to make it to downtown and try something that's not on the menu. It's somewhat fishy. We want to go and eat the famous local Arctic char. The main street is the heart of the nightlife in Whitehorse. Consists of countless pubs, restaurants, so this is the best place to find great hookups. I mean, great foods. And hard to find infamous Arctic char. If you can't find it here, you better get ready to go ice fishing. So, wish us luck. We've been asking locals what should we eat when we're down here in uh, Whitehorse and everybody's telling us eat the arctic char it's one of the local staples so that's what we're doing it's arctic char with uh fried capers and um we're about to try it right now fresh and buttery technical difficult the Arctic char is a native to the circular polar region of Northern Hemisphere, commonly found in alpine lakes and Arctic and subarctic coastal waters. Although they travel between fresh and salt water, they only spawn in fresh water. In many regions, it is an extremely important commercial fish species. Although it is similar to salmon or trout, but it has a milder and more delicate flavor.
Just five minutes walk from the main street is home to the Kualandan Cultural Center. First opened in 2012 on the banks of Yukon River, the center is a main gathering place and a home to celebrate the heritage and contemporary way of life of the Kualandan First Nation. The center consists of a long house, artist studios, a gallery, classrooms, and outdoor ceremonial space. It also offers various cultural and educational programs such as sewing circles, moose hair drafting, artists in residence to support the local indigenous artists. The Kualantan First Nation, also known as the White Horse People, occupied the traditional territory extends from Marsh Lake to the Lake La Bridge along the Yukon River, including the city proper of White Horse. Kualantan in South Tushomi means running water through a canyon, referring to a section of Yukon River from the Miles Canyon Basalt to the White Horse Rapid. Colonialism came to Canada and with it, hundreds of years of exploitation of both people and land. Indigenous peoples were forced to learn foreign customs and language in an attempt at ethnic cleansing by the church, the crown, and the government of Canada. Policies were set to erase the indigenous way of life. These policies included outlawing languages, cultural practices, political traditions, as well as forcibly removing children from their families. For the past week, we've been celebrating the 50th anniversary of Together Today for our children tomorrow. And in Yukon, that is a tremendously significant anniversary. Uh, 50 years ago, on February 14th, 1973, um, all of the chiefs from the Yukon got on planes and went to Ottawa to meet with the then uh, Prime Minister Trudeau. And for many of them, this was the first time out of the territory. They went to the Salvation Army, they bought suits, um, and then they sat down and they handed the Prime Minister this very thick document, um, the Together Today for Our Children Tomorrow document, that was both an airing of grievances in some ways, but also a path um, to be able to move forward together and to work together. Um, and the result of that document was 20 more years of negotiations, but at the end of it, 11 of 14 Yukon First Nations are now self-governing, um, with powers equivalent in, in many ways to provinces, um, and government-to-government -government relations. In celebration, the Longhouse will be filled with daily activities as well as nightly feasts, an opportunity for the community to be able to come together to reflect, to honor the leaders of yesterday, as well as to celebrate one another through special presentations, singing, and dancing. Well, we just think back to all of the great leaders that come from, from that area. We were not allowed to sing our songs, and now you are. So you sing them like no one's ever sang them before, and you understand that this is your responsibility. You are responsible to carry this on. Not even anything fancy, but just equality, so that we can grow into a world, you know, with absolute certainty that we belong here, and we are equal, and we are noble, and we are beautiful. A moving message. First we know Nation our history, dog. we know what happens. Ali. Ali. This evening I am grateful that we are able to celebrate the culture of our First Nations people. Through storytelling, singing, drumming, and dancing, First Nations are reclaiming their languages and traditional values. We find ourselves getting hypnotized by the meditative beats and the music while getting lost in the bright, beautiful colors of the entertainers dressed in full regalia. A performance by the Tinglet Dakwakwan dancers was an incredible way to finish off the last evening we were able to spend at the Kualandun Longhouse.
All right, I think I did a pretty good job of dusting off. It's not every day 12 of us are in Yukon. We definitely not coming here to sleep, especially not with each other. Sorry guys, we have absolutely no chemistry. But we do love our mighty rental car. Since we are returning it tomorrow, let's take this bad boy out for our last ride. That makes sense. We heard there's a lot of great place on Fish Lake to see the Northern Lights, the DIY style. It's about 22 kilometers away and takes about 45 minutes drive. I'm happy to let you know that everything went according to the plan. <laughs> Actually, not quite. Ugh. We made a stupid mistake. Well, here's the thing. Lots of people told us this is the place to go. Um, and you know, it costs about 100, 150 to see the the lights um, but we we heard of a spot to go to um, and it was smooth sailing until we turned on this last road yeah. we keep getting stuck and um, we tried to shovel yeah we got ourselves out um, and then got stuck again yeah my god I think you know what honestly coming in winter Maybe it's just a better idea to just pay the $150 to see the normal. So we couldn't find any logs to dig us out. So we broke a ton of branches after we cleared the tires and um, shoved sticks under it. That worked the first couple times. But A, we're getting exhausted and we, yeah, we're stuck again. Yeah, this is something I will never forget. I, I will never forget this experience. <laughs> I, I mean, I, I won't, ex I, trust me, it doesn't happen this often in Ontario. Even though our DIY mission to conquer the Northern Light have failed miserably, we did succeed in getting the RCMP, the Mounties, to show up to rescue us. Okay. I promise to pay my taxes on time from now on. <laughs> 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 I'm always late paying taxes. <laughs> you guys gave me a good reason. Good thing we're not CRA. <laughs> Do you get special trainings in doing this? Uh, patience. Hold up. Wow. There you go. After getting rescued, I promised those two Mounties that I'll pay my taxes on time from now on. I hope I can keep my words. So the final lesson here is unless you have a superior winter driving skills like those two Mounties uh, and the good weather conditions, just stay off nice the world world all together during the winter. Or else, if you get yourself into trouble, <laughs> forget about the chemistry. You may be forced to have sex in the car just to stay warm. Yikes. Morning. So we begin our day again here at the family hotel. And as you can see, the staff made us another breakfast. And this time it's Chinese. Wow. No, I'm just lost for words because these are all my favorites. Uh, this is onion pancake. Um, it smells amazing. This reminds me of my mother. Seriously, she makes great dumplings and they also have one of my childhood favorites, eggs and tomatoes, stir fry, as well as stir fry pork. And this is so impressive, handmade soy milk. So with that being said, I think it's time to eat. Mm. Oh my god, mm. so good. That's why I say in Chinese, so good. Make sure when the staff serve you this, you say xie xie. Mm -mm. All right. Okay. Time to drop off the car and begin our day. And uh, what adventure it is. I will always remember this car that brought us everywhere and got us into trouble, but experience you can find it on any type of tours here so thank you Yukon I agree the creek here it stays quite open and then we get the lazy bald eagles that don't want to migrate they just hang out and they can keep fishing walking down the street in a lot of cities you
Our adventure of the day is two-in-one, ice fishing and snowmobiling. This is a full day tour offered by very few operators in Whitehorse, but I like to pick the best and the most reliable local business to be my sponsor, the Up North Adventures. The pickup time is usually around 9.15 to 9.30 a.m. at your hotel, and drop-off is usually around 4 p.m. No, you do not need to pack any lunches because I was told we'd be fed. So let's be nice and say hi to our amazing tour guide, Kieran. My name's Kieran Kelly. I'm uh, I'm gonna be the lead guide today on our snowmobile and ice fishing tour. Uh, I'm originally from from Ontario, Canada, and I moved up here because we just weren't getting the winters that I remember from growing up. Hey, a little tip for all of you people coming to rural communities: do not trust Google Maps. All right, trust your common sense. Trust your mind, because if it's taking you on a road and you get you get the hair sticking up on the back of your neck, you might be going the wrong way. Now, there's a reason why Kieran is warning you on this. We're going to no other than Fish Lake, except this time with this expert driver. With that being said, we have arrived at Lakefront Cabin to start our fishing adventure. Oh yeah. The tour is not complete without my autograph. Uh, okay, so name. Maybe can you sign, please? Yes. Stereotypes are real in tourism, and the stereotype for Mexicans is they know how to have fun. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I can verify that. By the way, the two Mexican guests who will conquer the Arctic weather with us are these two, Antonio, and here to celebrate Gemma's birthday. So, let's wish her a happy birthday. For this trip, they'll be our besties. You know, we're all about safety, so do not play around with your GoPro if you're gonna carry one. Make sure you ask for a helmet that has a spot so you can just put your GoPro on your head and focus on driving your snowmobile. Commerce degree are not useful knowing how to do well in this. So, okay. Do, <laughs> Alright, by the way, I do work in a bank and I don't have a malicious intent. Just want to let you know. We are standing on water. ice, so but don't do worry. Gonna happen once it's I a hit the very water, thick ice, it's gonna come back and uh, exactly. this is not even like halfway through, so we are safe. It's kind of like when water freezes, it expands, it grows 11%. Okay, in this bowl of water that is the lake, it cannot push sideways, it can't push down, so it pushes up on the ice and causes it to crack. Okay, okay. so often when you're hearing the ice crack. You are listening to the surface getting stronger. <laughs> at 12 inches or 30 centimeters, you can drive a pickup truck. And at 18 inches or 45 centimeters, has anyone seen the show Ice Road Truckers? Yes. yes. This is what you need. Sarah thinks I don't have the talent to drill into the heart of women. Well, look like this is a perfect opportunity to show off my manhood. Yeah, if I can drill into three feet of ice with my bare hands, the day of me being single should be number. So, wish me luck. Uh, I need to show off. Uh, uh, if you're my future employer, please just watch the last part, not this part. <laughs> this is one way to help work off those uh, pandemic pounds you might be holding on to. Woo! I got it. I had to open up a little bit because I'm sweating. Ah! Ah! Yes! Ah! 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 I think so. Now I think yeah, I need to. Turn out. Ah. Go. Ah. Ah. I need a rest. CPR! CPR cars! Ah. 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 Passionate CPR oh benefit. God, After all that work, we are worth it with some slush. No, not the flavor you can find at the 7 Eleven. <laughs> rid of that layer of slush so that the bait and the hook will actually go into the into the hole and all the way into the water. 
Otherwise, it just sits on top of the slush. This guy's pro. And you're not going all the way down. So the grayling and char, they're really not very active at all in the winter. The lake trout, they love cold water, so they're still quite active in the winter. Uh, so that's who we're gonna be fishing for. We have little smelt on our hook. Uh, they're cut in half, and the trick is to get your hook down. Ooh. And then try to feel for the bottom and then bring it up about eight inches. Oh my god! Oh, 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 oh yes, yes! What? Oh. Just joking. Ice fishing is a practice of catching fish with a line and fish hooks or spears through an opening in an ice on a frozen body of water. It can be done any time of day, but the best chance for a big catch is during the dusk and the dawn. Different fish are active at different times of the day, so anglers need to be fished for them accordingly. Depending on the year, Yukon's ice fishing season begins in mid-winter and can go well into the spring. Oh my god! Am I right? Yo! No. I think you're caught on the ice. Oh! Man, you ruined my day! <laughs> <laughs> he caught a chunk of ice. Oh, it's a big one though. <laughs> <laughs> After all the hard work, it was a little disappointing that I didn't get to bring home the meat. But ice fishing is just mad out of luck. But regardless, we got some meat. Tasty one too. Fully cooked. Yes, yeah, so we got some uh, bison smokies here. Um, so bison, they're really, they're big animal. They're huge, but there's a lot of muscle there. So they're, uh, they're pretty lean meat. So they actually add a bit of pork fat into the sausages to make them a bit tastier for us. Ah. You, can't, you can't have it without the ketchup. Oh. Here, try some of that on there. Oh. Squeeze that on. I, man, this is first class service. <laughs> Who do you work with, sir? Up North Adventures. Up, Up North, North Adventures. Adventures. I don't know about this company, but uh, <laughs> I'm, I think I'm liking it. Okay, Momo of the Truth. Sponsored by Up North Adventures. <laughs> Good stuff, and don't forget to tip that dude. <laughs> so even if you don't catch a fish, you won't go hungry. So many sausages. Uh, this one is actually elk. So you can see it looks a little different than the bison. Um, let's try it. Whoa, that's juicy. It's better to be safe and yeah. know what you're doing, especially when you've got, what is this, 300 pounds or more worth of uh, metal that can crush you. Yeah, totally. Okay, uh, so what we're going to do uh, is everybody want to... A snowmobile, also known as a ski do, is a motorized vehicle designed for winter travel and recreational on snow. Generally to be operated on snow and ice and does not require road or trail, but most are driven on open terrain. Its history can be traced back to 1911. A 24-year-old Harold J. Kaysen patented the vehicle propeller in Brandon, Manitoba, Canada. So, up and then three seconds on the gray button. Today, the main snowmobiling race in the north is the Alaska's Iron Dog. The event is also the longest snowmobiling race in the world. It is 3,269 kilometers long and runs from the Big Lake to Nome to Fairbank.
After getting some practice in the frozen fish lake, our group continued on to the woodlands to get up and close with the plants and animals living in the area. Be mindful when you are traveling in groups. Make sure to keep the same consistent pace with other vehicles and a safe distance. Do not speed up or suddenly slow down. You definitely don't want to bump into other snowmobiles. With that being said, I think our Mexican friends are waiting for us on top of the hill. So we're walking to the lookout point. And what are we looking out at? Fish Lake, the place we were trying to get to yesterday uh, when we got stuck in the snow and had to be rescued by those two RCMP officers. Look at what we missed. Would have been a beautiful place to see the Northern Lights. But again, if you don't want to get stuck, best to take a tour. Since this is our last stop before we'll be returning to the cabin, I'll take this chance to get high. I mean, get some photos and videos from the high vantage point of this spectacular scenery with the backdrop of Mount McIntyre. I got a few collections of mine, so ladies and gentlemen, please sit back and enjoy these natural landscapes because this is how I'm going to brag about my amazing aerial videography skills. I think I look so cute in them. Sadly, this is the end of our full day tour of snowmobiling and ice fishing. As always, if you feel that your guide did an amazing job, be generous with the tips. It's much appreciated. For those of you who haven't got enough of snowmobiling, don't wait. We got another round uh, another day. For now, let's grab dinner. It's a little bit higher. We were invited by the owner of Antoinette, one of the very few multicultural restaurants in Whitehorse that serves great food and employs cooks from all over the world. But I think there's no better person to introduce it other than the owner and the chef James Concepcion. This uh, restaurant is uh, the original Caribbean restaurant in Whitehorse and it was owned by Antoinette. And uh, I took over the restaurant two years ago and I continued her legacy of Caribbean cuisine, but I also added a little bit of myself. I'm uh, ethnically Filipino, and uh, the staff that I have are from different countries all over the world, and I wanted to um, infuse a little bit of that in the cuisine that we have. I would say you've got to try our Caribbean lobster, so that's two humongous uh, tails of uh, lobster, which we cook in uh, Caribbean rum and lots of butter. Can't go wrong with butter. I'm not sure if you saw our India episode, but Charles would not stop about me finding a crazy rich Asian. Well, I finally found myself one tonight. Right here, this is one of Antoinette's signature drinks. It has lychee juice, sparkling wine, and a hint of ginger liqueur. Let's try it. Mmm, just a little spicy, how we like it. We're gonna start our dinner with a vegan gluten-free dish. Here we go. Okay, let's start with our appetizer. These are cuckoo sticks. It is polenta and it has some okra in it as well. It's fried and to give it a more of a Caribbean touch, there is some jerk dipping sauce. I have to try it with a sauce. Mm. Sweet and slightly spicy for some vinegar. Good stuff. Come on, what is yeah. this? Pacific escalope. 
Okay, so it's scallop and cream sauce mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and the uh, fire beans. Cook perfectly. Uh, smooth like butter. You can kill Wow. Alright, so the next dish right here is spectacular and beautiful. Lots of greens. Is Antoinette's attempt to conquer the Caribbean with the Caribbean cargo with, get this, Arctic chard, spinach, and kale. So, very multicultural dish. And it's a great time to try it out. <laughs> oh, what is Brazilian this one? Brazilian brown lobster. Oh gosh. It's so amazing. These two tails of lobster, and mm. it's so good. This is actually Antonin's signature dish, and I'm going to have to try out lobster in white horse. You can't go wrong. Completely fresh, good amount of spicing. Never yeah, hot. The meat is very tender and fresh. So mm. that's fine. If you got the budget, this is definitely one dish you have to try out. This one yeah. with dumpling. Yeah. Oh, so curry crab cake curry with dumpling. Curry crab cake with dumpling. Did you even try your beer yet? Yes, I have. It's very pleasant. Mm. But I have not tried this. Is Sarah? It is a uh, crab cake. Crab cake, crab cake and, and it's Trinidadian st um, style. The great thing is you can still feel the island and the heat even though it's full of snow outdoors. Wow, look at that crab cake. Again, seafood is cooked to perfection. After this much food, we ain't going back to the family destination hotel to sleep. We are going to burn it off by going back out to do more snowmobiling. <laughs> Just joking. Actually, Felix from the Up North Adventures is picking us up for another run on Northern Light. Alright, so we are going to another Aurora Borealis tour and this time with lots of young souls, really cool people over here. So. Please guys, don't drive on your own. The road here is, as you can already see from last night, it's not ideal. So, pay some money, relax, sit back, and I think you get free snacks, right? Free yeah, snack? you get free snacks. No, this, this guy give you free snacks. This you guy, everything. Do it does everything for you. Do the driving and all that, but in the end, just like you know, you have to tip. I mean, thank <laughs> you. Yeah, we we have a saying: don't don't tip the sled, but tip the driver or what? Tip yeah, the yeah. tour guy, right? Yeah, yeah. So, see you on the bus and have amazing time. The reason Sarah's not on, on is because she's putting her pants on. No. <laughs> Women are just a bit slow sometimes okay. and uh, some of them especially. The difference between the Northern Tales and this one is operated by Up North Adventures is this one's inside urine. As you can see here. And uh, a yurend. No, a yurt. A yurt. So we're inside a 30 foot yurt. Yes, okay. It sounded like you were saying urine, like okay. urine pee. Okay. The similarity is they both going to have a fire, out outdoor fire to keep everyone warm when they go outside. Uh, and they are also going to have indoor fire as well, right? So remember we tried to come to this lake last night and we got mm -hmm. stuck. By the way, that was totally her idea, driving to Fish Lake and yeah, so all the wrongdoings, you don't need to blame me, someone else I'm going to blame. No, 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 he believed Google Maps. Another difference with the Up North Adventure is we are driven out to the Fish Lake provided the ice thickness is at a safe level. Despite a clear sky, tonight is not our night. Once again, catching a magnificent Northern Lights largely depends on good luck. So Sarah and I want to wish you all the luck in catching that breathtaking spectacular Northern Lights. With that being said, it's time for us to head home and sleep because we got another full day in the morning. 
to start off the morning today. Did not expect this. We got noodles and Indian flavor and also Indian porridge. I'm sure some of you guys <laughs> will be asking how to eat our budget in Yukon. Well, the simplest answer is to start our television travel show. Uh, you get to eat everywhere for free. <laughs> Just joking. It can work though. Uh, but I think this is a better answer. Obviously, one thing I really hope is people come here to Whitehorse and Yukon and uh, enjoy the local food at a local restaurant and support the local people. But if budget becomes a real issue, the supermarket, that's one alternative. Um, most of the time you can find sandwiches for $5 uh, to $6, maybe $7. And as well, hot meals for $7, $8. So here's a little warning. If you don't like to wear gloves in this kind of weather, outdoors i got some bad news for you you're gonna have cracked skin look at that oh my gosh it is not pretty and it's actually very very painful actually get like a hand lotion and uh, try to uh, uh, moisturize your skin right and trust me i get no love from dove they are not my sponsor but apparently this is actually a good hand moisturizer After days and days of thrills, today we are laying back just a little. We are staying in town to check out some of the landmarks. The most famous on the list is the steam wheeler SS Condai. We are on the ground of the SS Condai National Historic Site and as you can see it's named after not one but two stone wheelers that served as a fleet between uh, Whitehorse and Dawson City between 1929 to 1936 and the second boat between 1937 to 1950. Why is there a second SS Condite? Well, sadly the first one was ran aground but was not completely destroyed because they was able to recover many of its parts and put into the second SS Condite uh, which served for many many years. And today is a part of uh, the National Historic Site here to remind us the history of Yukon. The Contact One was built by the British Yukon Navigation Company, a subsidiary of White Pass and Yukon Route Railway Company in 1929, and had the distinction of having 50% more capacity than a regular steam wheeler. While still having a shallow draft and meeting the size requirement in order to travel down the Yukon River, Contact One had a cargo capacity of 270 metric tons without having to push a barge. The Condite to carry the fleet until the early 1950s. Due to the construction of highway connecting between Stockton City and Whitehorse, many Yukon River steam wheelers were decommissioned. In an attempt to save the Condite 2, she was converted into a cruise ship by the White Pass and Yukon route. In 1955, due to lack of interest, the Condite 2 was left on its way to the Whitehorse shipyards. The ship was donated to Parks Canada and was gradually restored until 1966 when the city authority agreed to move the ship to its present location. On 24th of June 1967, the SS Condite was designated as a National Historic Site of Canada and now is open during the summer as a tourist attraction. The famous McBride Museum, which I heard so much, and there's so many positive reviews. They said it's actually the main museum here in the territory of Yukon, or Yukon territory, excuse me. So with that being said, let's get going. Most museums are only open on Fridays and the weekend during the winter. First on the list is the largest and the most important museum in all of Yukon, the McBride's Museum of Yukon History located in downtown Whitehorse. It's also only 15 minutes away on foot along the Whitehorse waterfront. The McBride's Museum is Yukon's first comprehensive museum that dedicated to the history of this land and its people. Uh, including its re resilience and the important history that have shaped to today's Yukon as Canada's territories. Now, the museum can sell 40,000 artifacts that illustrate 
uh, the Yukon's First Nation, the natural world, uh, many important events, and beyond. Founded in 1950 by the Yukon Historical Society and opened in 1952, named after the co-founder William McBride, an employee of White Pass and Yukon Root Company. This is the oldest museum with the most extensive and important collection in the entire Yukon. The museum consists of three sites, McBride's Museum, McBride's Roundhouse, and the McBride Copper Belt Mining Museum. However, only the McBride's Museum are open during the winter. There's a large exhibit dedicated to the First Nations in Yukon and explore their stories as a starting point for all of Yukon's history to the present. The collection includes the priceless handmade traditional clothing, artworks, cookwares, musical instruments, tools, and the ceremonial artifacts. The wild world allows you to get up and close to 35 species of animal commonly found in the Yukon. They include moose, coyotes, polar bears, just to name few. This section also has a sample of delicious meats. <laughs> just joking. It includes samples of different animal fur for you to touch and feel the difference, such as a bear rug and a coyote's coat. This is an outdoor area where the museum showcased many of the tools and vehicles that was used during the Yukon Gold Rush. The Gold Rush Gallery tells the story of a Klondike Gold Rush of 1896 to 1899 and how it shaped the modern day history of Yukon. Gold was discovered there by local miners on August 16, 1896 when the news reached Seattle and San Francisco the following year, it triggered a stampede of prospectors. Some became wealthy, but majority went in vain. To accommodate the prospectors, Boomtown sprung among the root. At the terminus, Dawson City was founded at the confluence of the Klondike and Yukon River. The town grew to house approximately 3,000 people by the summer of 1898. In the summer of 1899, the gold was discovered around Nome in West Alaska, and many prospectors left Kondai for the new gold field, marking the end of the Kondai gold rush. The boom town declined, the population of Dawson City fell, the gold mining production in Kondai peaked in 1903 after heavier equipment was brought in. Since then, Kondai has been mined on and off, and today, its legacy draws tourists to the region and contributes to its prosperity. The cold chamber section of the museum is where it teaches you how to make lollipops on the snow. <laughs> Just joking. Not quite. Actually, it dedicates to how Yukon people of past and the present lives in the cold and isolating environment. Collections include different clothing worn made from different animal fur, and their bones housed inside a cold chamber. I wanted to check out many other parts of the museum, including the Sam McGee cabin. There's also a map library, land and light gallery. So if you want to fully enjoy this museum, make sure to allocate at least 4 hours. It's really well worth it. But my visit was cut short with a call from our Mexican friend Jamma and her partner Antonio. We got 30 minutes notice to get to the airport. I was panicking. One of the volunteers, she's the volunteer at McBride Museum heading home, say, no problem, let me give you a ride. I came uh, up for a job after first year university way back in 1970, and uh, I knew this is where I wanted wow. to be. Uh, people are great. It's a uh, beautiful country, uh, friendly. You get to know well when you're here a long time, like I've been, you, you know a lot of people, you know the businesses. Uh, and like just saying, hey, I'll, I'll, I'm going home anyhow. Here, I'll just run you up to the airport. That's our amazing uh, volunteer here. We want to thank Jean for driving us. Thank you, Jean. You're the best. Oh. Okay. Bye, Jean.
Thanks for dropping us off. Uh, so we just got another ride from a local. This time, Jean dropped us off for our helicopter ride. We haven't taken a taxi yet, have we? No, but I heard it's pretty expensive. Yeah. So I'm actually really excited. We got invited by our amazing Mexican couple. Gemma and Antonio wanted to invite us to get high, <laughs> for real. Given me and Sarah haven't had too much luck finding love on the ground, this happy couple thinks we might got more luck by looking from the air. Oh yes, uh, we are finding our chopper to look for the love of our lives from high above. <laughs> Just joking. I'll tell you a little later what this special occasion after when we are all high. So we're getting a safety briefing. Okay. Safety comes first, as you can see. We're about to board right now. Uh, they are rebalancing the uh, chopper, so the lightest person goes to the front. So, so as you can see, it's actually pretty tight. You know when this full company, when we are shoulder to shoulder. <laughs> Pretty excited. Yes. And you, Charles? I'm very excited. Thank you very much. Uh, we are going to have a great time. Yes, we're going to have an amazing time. Tower control. Gravel. Sulu. Now the truth is, it's actually Jamma's birthday. Antonio and Jamma was nice enough to invite us to join them and celebrate this special day from the high up. So let's wish Jamma a happy birthday. We just learned that Antonio had proposed to Jamma, and obviously you know what the answer is. Therefore, we like to congratulate this newly engaged couple. We can't wait for our wedding invitation to come any day now. For the rest of you, please enjoy the spectacular aerial scenery of Yukon's landscape, courtesy of Gemma and Antonio.
After thanking Gemma and Tony for the ride, we want to dig deeper on how folks here get around. I definitely need to know in case I found the love of my life here and needed to safely make it to my date, especially during the Yukon's brutal winter. For now, we don't need to venture too far, since Yukon's transportation museum is only 3 minutes walk from the Eric Nelson Whitehorse International Airport. You won't able to miss it as there is a gigantic Canadian Pacific Airlines DC-3 on the pedestal right outside the entrance. Founded in 1990 and located on the land of Tachiwan Council, the museum brings the transportation in Canada's rugged Yukon territory to life. With a variety of indoor and outdoor exhibitions, the museum shares a glimpse and glimmer of Yukon's character through the stories of people moving themselves, their possessions, and the ideas around this vast landscape. Its mandate include identify, acquire, preserve, and conserve the history, cultural materials, and artifacts of Yukon's transportation mode, and to interpret this history in an educational manner for all Yukoners and visitors alike. With that being said, let's get started with my favorite form of transportation. And yes, there's a room dedicated to that. I'm also going to brag, I'm also a private pilot. Now as you can see, Yukon's weather is extremely, extremely harsh. Not every single type of aircraft are fit to fly in this kind of environment. So these are some of the aircraft are used traditionally in the past. That's not a lot you will find to today. Most of the collection are kept inside the main exhibition hall shallowed by a full-size wooden replica of the Queen of the Yukon. This was a single-engine monoplane to the spirit of St. Louis. The Queen of the Yukon was the first commercial airplane in the territory, made many historic flights. It was the first to deliver mail by air to Dawson City, a task performed by dropping the mail from the sky as it was determined that river ice was not significant thick enough to land on. One of the old carriages of a train, I'm pretty sure it's restored and there's actually a step encouraging you to hop right on. So let's go and have a look. One of the stars of the museum is a full-size replica model Lake Annie passenger car sit on top of the flat car donated by the White Pass and Yukon Route Company, a historic railway company that was founded in 1896 to meet the transportation needs of the Kondai Gold Rush as a means of reaching the gold field. The company operated the primary route for travel into the interior of the Yukon until 1982, when the price of metal plunged and the striking devastating effect on the mines that were White Pass and Yukon Route's main customer. Another interesting exhibition is the Miniature Railway. In 1997, the model train exhibit began with a grant from the Yukon Lotteries, which built the car cross portion of the White Pass and a smaller exhibit of Copper Belt Railway that ran from McRae to Pablo Mine at Fish Lake Road. The exhibit plan was eventually to build a model White Pass that ran from Skagway through the summit to the Bennett through a car cross and White Horse. Another section is dedicated to the water transportation in Yukon, in particular the steam wheeler SS Kondai. Due to the construction of a highway connecting from Dawson City and the White Horse, many of the Yukon River steam wheeler were decommissioned, and the SS Kondai was no exception to this fate. In an attempt to save the SS Kondai too, she was converted into a cruise ship by the White Pass and Yukon route. The Duke of Ellenberg was invited to tour the ship in 1954, being taken on a short trip down the Yukon River and back to White Horse during the day-long visit to the city. However, the venture shut down in 1955 due to lack of interest. The museum covers all facets of transportation in the Yukon, including Yukon's First Nations watercraft, dog sled, and the Yukon Quest, and the human propelled transportation like snowshoe and cross country skis. Uh, 
because it gets quite deep. And you always need to make sure you protect your eyes uh, as it's really bright, especially when the uh, sun bounces off the snow. The museum also have an extensive outdoor open air collection of transportation equipment, including several pieces from the White Pass and Yukon route, including a straddle carrier and an ore car, as well as a large variety of motor and mining vehicles, and even a Yukon River boat built in 1920s. All right, so we today morning we are going off to Mount Sima, and there's no other way to. Uh, get take, there. Yeah, unless you take taxi, but remember taxis are expensive, so if you can meet some friends and share a taxi, best yeah. bet. For job for three hours, you're more than welcome, but sorry guys, I don't have that much energy. With that being said, Hi, let's get you? in and good morning, good morning. Good morning. morning. Alright, let's get going. Mount Sima Ski Resort is located 15 kilometers from downtown Whitehorse. The mountain has a peak elevation of 1,035 meters and offers skiers and snowboarders a 335 meters vertical drop. First founded in 1989 by a group of volunteers called Great Northern White Ski Society, and after years of preparation, it was finally opened to the public on the Boxing Day in 1993. the whole mountain to ourselves but we need to say hi to the folks at Mount Sima because they want to give us a lesson on a thing or two about skiing yeah we've never done skiing before so uh, uh, you, wish us luck how do you know you told me wow <laughs> uh, well don't don't believe in everything guy tells you to just advice for yeah, girls def definitely like never believe anything he says yeah it's a more of a snow school question Okay, back to signing my uh, signing my life away. <laughs> Wish us luck today, okay? After years of financial difficulties in 2010s, the resource is now run by Friends of Mount Sima Society. Grew out of a group of dedicated individuals that intend to open their hills for the winter of 2013 to 2014. Today is a full-service ski resort staffed by a team of volunteers and few full-time staff. Including the amenities is the ski and snowboard rental shop headed by this good-looking and helpful gentleman, Kyle. They offer great gear at a great price. Having no gear is not an excuse not to come. I don't know if I accomplished that much in my life, but at least I accomplished one thing today. I managed to put on my ski boots all of them without any help. So that's one of my biggest accomplishments. No, with a little bit of help. Don't kid yourself. She's just can't put up with her. Not knowing how to ski or snowboard is also not an excuse. So guys, bring some coins and let's man up. Malsima has a snow school. They offer both group lessons and private classes for ski and snowboarding. The school is headed by the most beautiful and talented instructor Tasha. You bet my lawyers are drafting my marriage proposal. <laughs> I'll marry her in a heartbeat because she's very, very talented in finding good pizzas. Joe's is really good pizza. Joe's it's pizza. wood to oven pizza. He used to be up in Dawson, but now he's in Whitehorse. Okay, we are just about to start our first lesson. And get ready for a few bumps and falls along the way. You better not laugh at us or else, once again, we are going to haunt you on Facebook. For real. Mm -hmm. And then make sure your heels in the back, and then press down. Mm -hmm. And then you just want to kind of push yourself up. And if that doesn't work, just take off one ski. Yeah. So what Kelsha said is I bend a little bit, baby steps, baby step. And then pizza. And I start. Oh, nice, beautiful. And then look up, look at me, and pizza! Pizza! Sima is a great spot to learn because it's accessible for everybody. Yeah. Hi there. 
In the recent years, Mount Sima began to make adaptive ski and snowboarding accessible for those with physical, visual, and cognitive impairments. They offer both classes and adaptive equipment for their students at a very affordable price. So big kudos to their board of directors and staff. I think he is one happy skier. Now, let's get back to our lesson with Tasha. Beautiful! Looking good! We are doing it, there you go. And to stop, I do. Whoop. Good job, sir. I got to say, although we might not be ready for the next Olympics, we feel pretty accomplished for not embarrassing ourselves too, too much on camera. Oh yeah, we went all the way up to the top of the mountain and made it down alive. Actually, <laughs> not really, uh, we went up 100 meters. The beginner's hill or the bunny hill. Not a bad start for us, the newbies. Okay. I might not be ready for the Olympics, but I think I'm getting there. I just really want to say thank you to Tasha. I never thought I'd be able to ski due to all my uh, injuries and I'm feeling much more confident than I ever thought I would. So thank you for teaching us. You did a great job. Awesome. I'm so glad. Tasha left us feeling good. Taught us the basic of ski and as well were to get good pizza. But I got a feeling this is not the end of our time at Mount Sima. <laughs> but for now, we need a good rest. If you're wondering if you can get a workout even on the bunny hills, look at this. Sweat. So maybe um, I can lose some of that pandemic weight. Yes. I've got it here. This looks really nice. <laughs> Charles! Are you having fun? Absolutely, man. Our... The good weather. No, maybe not good weather. Oh, somewhat. Um, winter white horse weather, the classics. Mm. Um, Charles, how many times did you fall? Lost count. <laughs> yeah. But you know what? It's better to fall and learn how to fall properly, like these guys down here. Yeah. Are you recording? Absolutely. Okay, so Charles and I had a bet the other day and he lost. So his punishment, he's gonna lick a piece of metal. Um, we're gonna try it on the top. Yeah, right. Unless he chickens out. She's bullshitting. We finally made it up to the top of Mount Sima, and yes, I suggested we should try this trail. But Sarah, uh, oh wow. No, I'm not actually taking this one. This is for experience. We just learned the bunny hills today, but maybe one day. Good luck, guys. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you! Welcome, Welcome to the Yukon! Yeah! We're going to Mount Sima, by the way. Now, I know lying is a sin. If you don't know, most television shows have multiple scenarios. Our show is no exception. Therefore, I'm going to be honest enough to admit these breathtaking shots of Mount Sima was taken on a previous day when the sky was crystal clear blue. So, let's time travel back to my journey here the first round, and please sit back and enjoy the ride. Hello, thank you very much. I 
currently we are on top of Mount Sima. This is the, the lift that will bring you up all the way here. So let's check out the actual map of and different trails. So and I am really excited. Even if you don't ski or snowboard, you can still get high here. I'm getting high up to the top of Yukon. There's a well-marked trail to the top of the ski slope to a small observation deck. Since there's wild animals, make sure you don't leave any food behind and bring your own trash back with you. With that being said, let's get high for real. Trail, because there is actually an observation point right there. So this is a view that's worth dying, I mean, living for. Check this out. Man, that view is absolutely spectacular up there. You can even come here, even if you don't ski, ski or snowboard, but obviously that's the main attraction here. I think we are inconvenient a lot of their lovely staff today because I keep going up and down. They're stopping me, they're stopping the, uh, the lift just for me. So yeah, it's, um, it's a very pleasant experience. Sadly, it is time for us to return the skis. Remember I say our time is not over in Mount Sima? You bet. I suggest you really feel up right here because there's some serious action coming ahead. If you want to support the people of Ukraine, make sure to grab some of their Kiev fries. They are delicious. The third floor of Mount Sima Resort is home to a pub and a spacesuit changing area for our mating launch flight to the moon. <laughs> Just joking. This is a meeting place for the Ruby Range, another one of our sponsors for snowmobiling adventure. So, this, so this is the round two of uh, <laughs> snowmobiling, this time with Ruby Range. So I'm excited and Sarah's uh, excited as well. See the difference between Ruby Range and Up North Ventures. Let's get going. Yeah, so there's a lot of heavy equipment like by now, I'm sure you're familiar with these tour procedures. They all got a safety orientation, but this time we got this young man presenting it with the German accent, all included in the price. Give me one, Greetings from Ruby Range. Uh, snowmobiling, it's awesome. While Up North Adventures offer a combination of snowmobiling and ice fishing snowshoe in a day tour, Ruby Range are specialized in half and full day tour for snowmobiling. Therefore, you spend more time on the vehicle, 35 kilometers to be exact, on this trip. They also offer newer snowmobile with heated handles. Another difference is the sceneries. Your journey begins on the Trans Canada Trail, a multi use trail that connects Canada coast to coast to coast. It is made up of hundreds of individual trails linked together from the world's longest recreational trail, stretching over 24,000 kilometers and passing through all 13 provinces and territories. Eventually, you turn onto a Cold Lake Road Trail passing through more woodlands and ending up in the cold lake. This area is home to two herds of southern lake caribou, which are often spotted. I think we just arrived. So ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Cold Lake. This is where you're going to be let loose and go crazy.
Cold Lake is a large inland body of standing water and which flows into Yukon River. The lake measures approximately 3 km long by 1 km wide and used by the indigenous people for Chinook salmon fishing. In the winter, the surface are frozen over and popular for recreational snowmobiling, snowshoeing, and ice fishing. So, for the next couple of minutes, please enjoy the beautiful scenery of Cold Lake from the air. It was time to get going, and once again, please enjoy the spectacular winter backdrop along the woodland trails. On the way back, we traveled through the trail on the Golden Horn Mountain. One of the drivers got stuck. I could not resist taking a photo stop as there are so many amazing viewpoints. Once again, ladies and gentlemen, please let me show off my aerial photography skills. Okay, that's enough. Let's drive back safely. It's getting late. We made it back to Mount Sima and park our snowmobiles then realized there is no taxi to take us back. But rest assured, as long as you get back before everyone are gone, you're always going to get options to hitch a ride with a local. But make sure to be courteous and offer some money for the gas. This is how we made it back to the downtown Whitehorse. And what do I have? Bison shepherd's pie. Bison guys, bison, mm. not beef. Mm. It's too good to go away. Thank you, Air North. Yes, thank you. We were absolutely brain dead after returning home to our sponsor hotel, Destination Family Hotel. However, we still got some brain cells to know that we need to prepare our flight home on Air North and looking forward to eating their tasty in-flight meals. Actually, Sarah and I can't wait any longer. So it's time for us to try out another one of their meals. Mmm. Mm. It has a different consistency for sure than like, what do people use? Beef, ground beef, I suppose, for Super shepherd's lean. pie? I think it's very, very lean. Mm. And also the mashed potatoes, like so, so creamy. It's amazing. Okay. Who are you? <laughs> Who are you? Next morning, Sarah headed off again to meet her canine besties and spend a full day with Aladuk Adventures. She gets to meet some of the new guests as well. Lucky her since she'll be spending an extra day enjoying White Horse. How are you? So I am on my second tour uh, with Alayak adventures today uh it's getting colder it's the coldest it's been since we've been to yukon so we've got six groups with us for our afternoon tour and um we have the option of riding in the sleigh or you can drive this uh drive the sled so depending on how comfortable you are you can take a, a turn uh driving for me, it's the last chance to pick up some nice women in Whitehorse. I mean, uh, uh, some nice souvenirs for my friends and families. The perfect spot is the main street and it's full of gift shops. So, good luck on finding a great bargain. Once again, the public bus is the most inexpensive way to get to the airport, provided you got no heavy luggage. Alright, thank you so much, our driver here. Friendly taxi. Totally legit. But I got two check luggage along with the broadcast equipment. So I got no choice but to experience the world's most expensive airport taxi. Oh yeah. Thank you so much for your help. That's a very friendly yeah. taxi right here. Thank I you. won't forget your name. You know why? Uh, My son's his name is Charles. <laughs> you wonder how much is a ride? It's actually. 
The Eric Nelson Whitehorse International Airport is a hub for Air North with connection to cities in British Columbia and Alberta. Seasonal flights are offered to Calgary or WestJet and Frankfurt on Condor. However, I'll be flying on Air Canada for the two and a half hour flight departing for Vancouver. The security is pretty fast compared to other Canadian airports, but just to be on the safe side, I recommend you arrive no less than 100 hour prior to your departure time. <laughs> just joking, I mean one hour prior to the departure of your outbound flight. So we just have a pushback, and I think we should be on our way soon. As for Sarah, she'll be finishing out the Air North meal this evening. This time is Thai curry chicken soup. Actually, this soup looks a little more like stew. Like, look at this big, chunky, chunky, right? Oh, maybe I'll eat that bite. Looks like a chunk of chicken and daikon. That was definitely daikon. Um, I tried some of the rice. It has edamame in it as well. Mmm, good meal. In the morning, Sarah headed to the airport the most economic way, by the good old public bus and boarded the Air North flight bound for Vancouver. Remember guys, drinks and meals are included along with a two-check baggage in their connector fare, all for $99 at the time of the filming of this episode. And this marks the end of our magnificent journey of Whitehorse and the Kwani National Park. There's so many reasons to visit the Yukon, famous for being the tourist hotspot for the northern lights, winter adventures, and the spectacular landscape. But for Sarah and I, coming to this land is about discovering a part of our home country, Canada. To appreciate its natural beauty and to find reasons to protect it for our future generation. To retrace Yukon's colorful history. To walk in the footsteps of pioneers and explorers who attempted to make a fortune in the Kondai Gold Rush. To learn about the shameful part of a country's past, the suffering of the First Nations people, and how we can heal and build a future together, and to celebrate their culture through songs and dances, to experience a way of life in the isolating and harsh winter climate through many of its traditions. Coming to Yukon is a homecoming for us, to realize that it is a privilege to call this land, this country, Canada, our home. Thank you for watching. Takanta 